New Century. All digital high definition television, flat screen plasma TV sets in the home. But you know it wasn't that long ago that a group of pioneers invented television every day. And those were the friends we all grew up with. So I drove to Toledo and went to the Commodore Perry Hotel. This was in the latter part of 1947. And there was a television set in the bar, and I'd never seen one before. I'd seen pictures of them, but I'd never seen a real television set. Nobody knew anything about it. Over those early years, we were inventing television news. It's different now. It was a little more difficult when you stop to think about it. First, we had to entertain. But then we could uh, wind in some educational things with the entertainment. Dean did a lot of this. He'd just break into a, a laugh or a joke or start, start talking about something, and he covered. He built. And, of course, the dancers never made a mistake. <laughs> you hadn't tried this before. You didn't know if it was going to work or not. And if it blew up on you, it blew up. TV was the thing that I could see was going to outlast even the newspapers. So I asked the bartender if it worked. And he said, sure. And he turned it on. And he said, what are you doing? I said, the best I can. You just had to learn on the air. Inventing a whole industry. And I had a feeling of absolute certainty right then that this is going to revolutionize society, and I had to have one of them. Turn along the SAC and friends and people. Known for some time. The top man in the whole broadcasting and television. The SAC television. Augustine. Information. That's the news until now. Entertainment. Something about the Harry Nails and the Hail of The Huntley Brinkley Report next on Channel 3. Thanks. This station is equipped uh, to render all radio and television service. WSAZ will bring you color as soon as it's available. WSAZ is expanding personnel. Pioneer and television. Seating the telephonic conflicts. Charles Ryan and Charles Steele with tonight's news. WSAZ. Adopt the twin towers, ranging more than 100 feet above ground. I'll be back to tell you how warm it's going to be after this. WSAZ. Friends we all grew up with. A WSAZ 50th anniversary celebration will return after these messages. The summer of 1949. The nation is closing out the decade. It's a time of fragile peace, with the Berlin airlift underway and rumors of a Russian atomic bomb. And on the south side of Huntington, West Virginia, a tower rises from a hilltop as a few brave businessmen take a very uncalculated risk, constructing one of the nation's first television stations. And it actually started as almost a freak. Uh, Bud Rogers, who was the genius that made this station what it was in its early days. Bud wanted to put a television station on. He was the son-in-law of the family that owned the hunting publishing company and the radio station, WSAZ. He went to his father-in-law and to his, uh, his father, grandfather, and tried to talk him into it. And went immediately to my father-in-law, Walker Long, and I said, we got to have a television s station. Well, he about had a a stroke because he said the one-way ticket to bankruptcy we couldn't possibly do a thing like that and Colonel Long the patriarch of the family said well look I don't really know anything about this television and you've already got an application in for an FM radio station and I don't know what that is but we'll go ahead and put the TV application in and whichever one clears the Federal Communications Commission first you get that one and you cancel the other one and through a freak the television application cleared all the hurdles in Washington, came through immediately before the FCC put a freeze on new television station construction. Colonel Long, who was 86 and I was 27, built that station together over the objections of everybody. On October 15th, 
The region's first ever TV signal was broadcast to the few people in the tri-state who had sets. It was a test pattern, followed by a list of TV set distributors. And so began the history of WSAZ TV. And a series of bold, risky moves over the next 50 years that would propel it to prominence as one of the most successful television operations in the country. From the outset, there were problems to solve and challenges to overcome. The first challenge was to get the station up and running long enough to begin making a profit, something that no other station at the time was doing. Uh, we didn't have all the money in the world to build that station, and so uh, we weren't going to build a big palace, and so we knocked down the walls of, uh, of two offices in the West Virginia building and made the studio out of three offices. And then we had three other offices that uh, were the offices of the station. And uh, one other office that was the uh, engineering department. And then there was the problem of airtime, as in too much airtime and not enough programming. Although WSAZ hit the ground running by televising a live Marshall College football game only a month after signing on, there was still no real local programming and no way to receive a direct network signal. So the station went about creating its own local shows and local celebrities. The first local shows were patterned somewhat after the network TV and radio programs at that time. They included talk and variety shows, many featuring musical performances. The show's creators were literally making it up as they went along limited only by their own imagination. And for the early personalities, WSAZ airtime was a live, exciting, fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants experiment. Holler, Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> but DJ, I used to love it when she came on there. She could invent things. She would say, and tonight, no, I'm, not, I'm just doing this. I hope DJ sees it. Tonight, we're going to say happy birthday to everybody named Leroy. Thank you, Joe. I have a special hello tonight for everybody watching the show named Floyd. He would, um, he'd do his commercial, and then at a certain point, he would start pouring the beer, and there would be the foam on it, and the foam on it, and it looked like it was going to go over, and it never did. He could always just put it up to his mouth, just to his lips, and say, One of America's two finest beers. As far as I know, it never did spill. And he said it was his secret. <laughs> One of the most popular local shows was Coffee Time, a morning variety show featuring interviews, skits, and musical entertainment, all in front of a live studio audience. Which was a direct copy of Don McNeil's Breakfast Club on the radio. And the reason we did it was the fact that my friends Pat Weaver and Dick Pinkham at NBC started up the Today Show. So the station went on the air at 7 o'clock in the morning instead of the middle of the afternoon. And uh, most stations around the country when the Today Show started would go on from 7 to 9, then they'd go back and put the test pattern on and go back on the air in the afternoon. So instead of going off the air at 9 o'clock, we went on to put a, a talk show on. And it was very successful. It was successful commercially from the very beginning. We had um, Bud Daly or Dean Sturm uh, as anchor. Jewel Huffman sang, a lovely girl by the name of Sue Chambers sang. Coffee time became such a hit that people would drive for hours in the pre-dawn darkness to get a seat in the audience. And there was a line out front just like the Today Show is today in front of WSAC. You finally had to have tickets to get into that coffee time show. But I mean, that was big time. The first real major local program, other than news, was that coffee time. Other programs included Current, with husband and wife team Bob and Jan Carr. Twilight Time, with Jewel Huffman and Brownie Benson's combo. And The Camera Goes to School, an educational program. Daytime cooking shows were also popular, such as Maida's Kitchen and Katie's Kitchen. WSAZ stars were always on their toes, never knowing when they would be asked to host a show 
act in a live commercial, or conduct a man-on-the-street interview at a moment's notice. When we return, kids get in on the act. My goodness, this was a dragon with a big horn, and the kids went screaming and climbing under their beds. And a Saturday night tradition is born. The big circle, everybody goes up to the middle and yells, Hoopee, coming back. And she didn't come back. She just stayed there. <laughs> she fell down. <laughs> taking advantage of the popularity of country music. WSAZ began airing a live Saturday evening program that would last for 18 years. And to this day is remembered as one of the most popular shows ever to air on Channel 3. It's the Saturday Night Jamboree brought to you by Ashland Oil and Refining Company, refiners of A-plus gasoline. So good it's guaranteed more powerful for your money back. Hosted by Dean Sturm, Saturday Night Jamboree quickly became a weekly tradition, and its performers became local celebrities. They wanted to start a, a big jamboree show on Saturday night. Well, that was really pleasing to me, and we did it, and uh, the first show was a big success, and they had a live audience, and people come in from as far away as 150 miles. People would come, and uh, they'd line up for blocks trying to get in to the station. A lot of the families didn't have televisions when it first started. And people would go and look in the store windows and watch it because they'd have the loudspeakers on outside so they could hear it. Well, I used to love the personal appearances. We would, we would go out, like she was saying, we'd go out several times, you know, during the season and, uh, man, they were wild. We really enjoyed those. They treated us like, like big time stars. Some of the artists that was on that show, I remember, was, uh, was Ralph Shannon. He, he was a, quite a fella. He, uh, he always uh, sung a lot of Marty Robbins songs. And then there was Connie Smith, and you know what happened to her, of course. They had uh, held auditions, and I went down and won the audition, so I got to be a regular on uh, Saturday Night Jamboree for a while. Her husband came up during the show and asked Dean if she could uh, sing with the band. And of course, we all just kind of looked at each other and went, <clears throat> right. Well, this little tiny thing about five feet two and seven and a half uh, months pregnant came up on the stage and they asked her what she wanted to sing and she gave them a, a song and they said, what key? And she said, key? Well, they got going and she opened her mouth and the rest of it's history. The Saturday Night Jamboree was a big part of mine getting started. And Dean Sturm was great. Well, I guess one of the greatest directors in the whole tri-state area there was Fritz Leitner. He was a great guy. And he always made me look good on camera, and Fritz, I thank you for that. <laughs> I remember Fritz. <laughs> As with the other live shows of the time, there were unpredictable moments, which only made Jamboree all the more fun. I was so green that I, I would love to get a copy of the, of the show that I was in the middle of singing a song and all of a sudden it hit me. I was on television so I ran to the bathroom. <laughs> Nobody on camera. <laughs> so I was pretty green. But, but Dean Sturm kind of straightened me out and said, don't do that again, and I didn't. <laughs> it was hard to get anything over on Harry. Now, Dean tried a lot of times, but he always had a comeback. Harry! As I heard before we went on the air, where are you refereeing tonight? Right here, right here. I just, just started to turn gray. I'd put some loving care on my hair, and the sweat had started to run down my forehead, I never and down my, that. Not my white shirt collar. And he said, uh, who does your hair? And I said, Miss Peg. Time for action, time for action. one thing, it's time for Harry Mills and the Hayloft. It was 
was all live. It was live. It was, it was live. live. And it was a go from the start. They still tell me, we used to watch you on television. Made me feel good, and made me feel good that people at home watched us. Yeah, it was great. Come on, kids, let's go! Another segment of TV's audience was growing up in front of the two. The networks and WSAZ recognized the need to entertain the kids. Children's shows quickly became a staple on WSAZ, first with shows like Popeye and His Pals, hosted by Bob Carr. The Old Timer with Bob Mills. Mickey Banga as Aunt Rue. And The Beachcomber, starring Don Wagoner. Then, WSAZ announcer and newsman George Lewis donned a captain's hat, climbed aboard the SS Never Float, met a sea monster named Merlin, and Steamboat Bill was born. Well, one Friday, the program director came in and said the fellow that was doing the children's show would not be back Monday. And I was to uh, fill in for a little while, just temporarily, until they found somebody. And they would be auditioning people, so it would just be on a day-to-day -day basis. Just fill in. And that's what I was doing. And the days dragged on to a couple of weeks. And finally, I went to the promotion department and said, look, can I have about 5,000 membership cards printed up? And they said, okay. I said, now wait a minute. We both may get fired for this. That's all right. They printed up 5,000 membership cards, and I showed them, started showing them that Monday. And the 5,000 cards went the first week. And then the program director and the general manager said, well, I guess you're going to be doing the show. We have Merlin right here. Merlin right here. A little boy on a personal appearance one time said, what does Merlin the sea monster like to eat? I said, well, sea monsters are vegetarians. And sometimes he gets in the habit now of eating too many French fries and all. His next question was, how hot are the lights? You see, he was going back and forth from reality to pretend, to reality to pretend. So I was never fooling them. I was pretending with them. A few years later, the show's format was changed. Steamboat Bill was retired, and Lewis's new character was introduced, Mr. Cartoon. left WSAC, Jewel Huffman became the Mr. Cartoon most of us remember and continued the show into the 90s. When I first went on that show, oh, oh, I couldn't keep up with them. And I walked in that day and I was sick. I came in. I was tired. I didn't feel good. And I said, boy, this is one day I don't know whether I can make it or not. And I went out there and remember they had the steps come up and there was a place up there with a big picture of Mr. C and the door was over here. And I came out there and there was a little girl sitting there. And as I walked in, she looked and she went, <gasps> oh. and I went, <laughs> started laughing. And I got over there and I worked with the kid and the next thing I'm laughing and I'm having a big time. And I walk in and I'm young and tall, you know me. I'm like, did you see this? Did you see that? You know, oh, I'm in a big dime. And somebody said, where's your headache, Jewel? And I said, I left it out there. It's gone. What is your name? Brandy what? Call you freckles. Go, go, <laughs> go, go, dance, dance, come on. Oh, dance, that's it. Come on, faster, faster, jump, that's it. Little One, hit. two, three, go. That had to go to the back. And he just sat there and cried. There was a little girl sitting on the side of you know. And I said, oh, I realized what was up was too late. You could see the water running down the steps, you know. And I said, oh, goodness gracious, you know. 
and uh, but that wasn't the thing. I got the little boy and I hugged him. You know, I, I like kids. I love them. I, they, they they do something for me. When they come up and they put their arms around me, I feel that in the heart. I, I really do. And I said, somebody take this little fellow and take him to the bathroom, you know, and and get him cleaned up. I mean, he's not. And I said, don't you worry about a thing. It's all right. We all went through this. And then kind of a little smile and he walked out. I turned around and everybody, all the little kids that were brownies were running and scattering around because this little girl was going patty cake, patty cake, patty cake. And the water was, spl you know, was splattering all over the place, hitting them. And I said, don't let it bother you girls. I hear it's good for your complexion. <laughs> I'm the mothers, I tell you, they went under the table laughing. You know, I didn't mean to do that, but I did. This message. Humble beginnings for the region's news leader. We hope you are enjoying this evening's presentation. You can now purchase a VHS copy of this program along with a companion coffee table book for the special price of $39.95 plus shipping and handling. That's a savings of $10. Send check or money order to WSAC Anniversary Offer, P.O. Box 2115, Huntington, West Virginia. If you would prefer to order with credit card, just drop us a postcard with your return address requesting our credit card order form. The news picture has been compiled and edited through the facilities of the WSAZ TV News Department. As a news operation, the people of WSAZ again found themselves treading new ground. News reporting procedures had been established by newspapers and radio, but there were unique challenges to TV news. We didn't have any film cameras, and we didn't know how to uh, put the stuff together. So news was a bit of a problem. And the uh, young man that, that uh, we had as our news director, Nick Basso, uh, was turned over to us by the radio station because they didn't want him. <laughs> and he was a, a scrawny little fellow, but he looked swell on television. You couldn't tell he was a scrawny little fellow on the television camera. That's right, about 135 pounds for years. Your reporter, Nick Basso. Good evening. The answer to Huntington's quandary over financing an $11 million sanitary sewer project. They invented the business of stringers, and they brought about uh, two dozen photographers from all over our coverage area and had a seminar in Huntington in which they told these people that we would send them a one-minute roll of film and that they could cover any kind of local events they would, and if they would uh, if they'd send us the film back after they were taught how to edit in the camera so we wouldn't have to edit the film, we got it back. If they'd send us local news stories, we would pay them at some uh, fairly good rate for anything we used, but we wouldn't pay, pay them for anything that we didn't use. But once they sent us a film, we would send them another piece of film. So we had probably as many as two dozen stringers all over eastern Kentucky, southern Ohio, and, and most of West Virginia. And they would send us in this, this local news footage, and uh, it created something of a sensation. Deadlines then were what we called same-day coverage. Uh, our films were processed by hand in the negative. It wasn't a, a positive picture. It was done by hand by Willis Cook, our first chief photographer, who uh, dipped those things into huge vats and uh, process them. It took about 18 minutes for a 100-foot roll to go through. And then he had to dry, dry them. And many times when we were trying to meet the deadline of going on the air, he was drying them with a hair dryer. Well, one of the things that uh, uh, always stands out in my mind was the, was the great success we made of televising the West Virginia High School Band Festival every year. That became about a three-day event, mostly because of television. It had been a one-day event until television came along, and then it became a, a monster thing. And bands from all over the state of West Virginia came to Huntington because it was the only city in West Virginia with, with streets big enough to <laughs> have a couple hundred bands in. And all the people of Huntington opened their houses, and, and that's where the, the kids stayed in uh, 
in private houses all over the city but because people volunteered to do that. And it was a great event. And one year, we had just finished the, the uh, band festival, and all of a sudden, somebody yelled fire, and I thought we were on fire. It was the Gwynn Milling Company, which was at the foot of 10th Street, was on fire. They had a great grain elevator there at a huge uh, uh, milling company. And that thing went up in flames and made the most spectacular sight anybody's ever seen. So we put cameras up on the roof of the West Virginia building, and we had Nick Basso down on the street interviewing firemen and all kinds of people. And the thing went on uh, a whole afternoon and well into midnight, by which time we have our salesman on the phone calling advertisers, asking if they'd like to put some special advertising into this fire thing. <laughs> so the Gwynn, the Gwynn Milling Company burned to the ground, but we made a profit out of it. <laughs> our newsrooms over those early years, we were inventing television news because we were the among the first on the air with it. And uh, Nick and I would go to uh, RTNDA, the Radio Television News Director Association conventions, and talk with others who were doing the same thing we were doing, inventing a whole industry. I had the feeling that uh, we were cultivating trust, that we were, we were, I tried to operate on that idea that as long as the News people could be trusted with uh, the region. Um, they wouldn't have to operate like celebrities to get what they needed to know. Because people started to call us when we uh, developed a type of uh, news program that told what went on. And then we have developed uh, a correspondent system. We were one of the earliest ones to establish 50 or 60 people in the four-state region. Nick Basso, my predecessor as news director, and his staff and, and those of us who were working with him, we'd done enough things right by then that the community, the broad community, had come to depend upon us. And as long as we didn't kick them out, they indicated their willingness to stay with us. And that loyalty in this area stays with WSAZ to this day. From the beginning, WSAZ's leaders knew that in order to maintain the advantage they had gained as the region's first station, they must stay on the edge of television technology. In 1950, to get live programming from the networks, WSAZ built a microwave relay system between Huntington and Cincinnati. Other innovations followed. Transmitter upgrades in 52 gave WSAZ for a time the world's most powerful TV signal. In the summer of 1953, having outgrown their studios in the West Virginia building, they renovated an empty factory building on Huntington's 9th Street into a state-of-the-art radio and TV broadcast facility. The following year saw the area's first glimpse at local color TV when Channel 3 purchased new cameras and began broadcasting in living color. But one of WSAZ's biggest risks today might have been that same year, 1954. A technological innovation that would have an impact on NBC News itself when friends we all grew up with returns. In 1954, Bud Rogers was looking for ways to keep WSAZ growing and improving. And that meant increasing the revenue stream. The problem was that, that uh, we couldn't do very well with national advertising because uh, Huntington is about the 100th radio market and Charleston was about the 75th radio market. And they were way beneath the uh, dignity of the New York advertising agencies. And so when we got the first high-powered transmitter and that 1,200-foot tower out there on Barker's Ridge, we were putting a city-grade signal over uh, Charleston as well as Huntington, Portsmouth, and we had an enormous coverage area. So uh, with the aid of a fellow named Saul Paul, who was the publisher of Television Age, we put together an advertising program where we uh, called the market the charleston hyphen Huntington market, and it was the 23rd ranking market in the United States in terms of total homes reached, and uh, 
that really cha changed the whole thing around from our being a local station to our being a wide area station as a result of which we had unlimited amounts of national advertising, just like that. But as far as I know, we were the first hyphenated market in the United States, and we did it on purpose because <laughs> we were going after national advertising dollars. I did the first broadcast out of Charleston. Uh, we put a newsroom into a radio station in Charleston, WKAZ, and staffed it with a news team and uh, went from there in order to say to Charleston, hey, we're going to do your news. And at that time, we literally split it down the middle, and Charleston had just as many seconds on the air as Huntington did, and were to do Charleston and state capital news. The reason was very obvious. We got to serve that market if we're going to exist. And so uh, we did. WSAZ's two-city news operation was firmly in place and its reputation established as the respected news leader, not just locally, but on a national basis. Uh, the producers of what was going to be the Huntley-Brinkley Report came down and watched what we were doing uh, to take back to the network to help them formulate the Huntley-Brinkley Report. We had been doing two cities since, what, 1954, 55. I don't remember when the Huntley-Brinkley Report debuted, but it was about 58. It was, uh, if I remember, in the wake of a political convention. Um, they, they wanted to see what kind of problems we had, mistakes we had, what they could avoid. And I think they gleaned some solid information from us. We had, by then, pretty well learned how to do it. I don't know, maybe that's not true. You may still be learning how to do it. In the following years, local entertainment programming would experience a decline. An increased emphasis would be placed on local news coverage. WSAZ would always be there at the forefront, providing the coverage its viewers had come to expect. Many of the stories were good, but too many, it seemed, were tragic. Either way, WSAZ's reporting of those stories made sure the experience will stay forever with the viewers who watch them and the people who reported them. Remember the 1960 primary election. The night before the, uh, the election, everybody had gathered in the studios, wall-to-wall -wall people, the, uh, all the hangers-on and all. And I was in the control room, staying away from the crowd. And I saw Mrs. Kennedy reach into her pocketbook and pull out a cigarette and fish around for a match. She didn't have one. And nobody else was lighting her cigarette for her. When I went out of the control room, it took me a good three minutes to get to her through the crowd. And I lit her cigarette and had a few moments of conversation with her. And on my way back, I passed very close to John Kennedy. He was exhausted. After a presidential campaign, you can imagine, this is the night before the primary election, West Virginia was the one that would put him in. He couldn't be denied the Democratic uh, uh, presidential nomination. And I said, do you want to escape? He said, yeah. So I knew he couldn't just turn his back and walk out. So I said, well, just follow me. And I stayed a few feet ahead of him. And he shook hands and worked his way out. And I finally got to the door and led him down the hall to the newsroom. So I had about 40 minutes with John F. Kennedy all by myself. Uh, quite a memorable experience, but it was all small talk. I didn't want to burden him with a lot of questions, but he just wanted to sit down and relax for a moment. I suppose this just tells you what department in the station I worked in. I was in news, and therefore what I think of mostly are tragedies. Uh, Holden 22, Mannington, which uh, Charlie Ryan covered all on his own. Uh, Buffalo Creek, where Roger O'Neill was just supreme in his coverage. Uh, the Silver Bridge collapse, which was really a huge team effort. And you, re you don't think about it until you get into it. When the Silver Bridge went down, we had to send crews up out of Huntington on each side of the river because there was no way to cross over any place else. Now the Silver Bridge was gone. And then, of course, I suppose the one that, that still hits me most is the Marshall plane crash. 
Uh, when the Marshall plane went down on Saturday night, the 14th of November, I was at home. Uh, I had been offered a ride on the airplane. It was late in the season, and there was really no reason for me to be there. We hired somebody to shoot the film or the tape, and it was coming back on the plane. And it was a chance for me to spend a weekend at home with my family, and I didn't get that very frequently. And I recall this so well, uh, Andy Williams' show was on uh, Channel 3, and Jerry Sander, who's now working in Lexington, was the newsman, and he broke in with a bulletin that, that a plane has gone down at uh, Tri-State Airport. And I knew it was about that time. And I hurriedly got dressed and came to the station because I knew he would need some help. And it was, I listened to the radio, and they confirmed it was the Marshall plane. Uh, I was on the air that night for several hours, and I knew that I was talking into homes where, where there were no parents left, or talking to the dorm, where all of those dorm rooms were empty. And I confess to you that when we finally stopped broadcasting about 3, 3.30 in the morning and I went home, I was feeling mightily sorry for myself because I knew dozens of those people. And I got home and realized that my wife had recognized that in the next block from where we lived were uh, orphaned children from that crash. And she went up and took the junior high school daughter, who was a friend of our daughter's, out of the home, brought her to our house for the night, where she watched the film. And, uh, you know, Dottie had to be that evening's parent for her. Much tougher job than mine. It was a night of horror. You could not comprehend that this had actually happened. It was almost as if uh, it was a dream. And I recall thinking, I will wake up, and this isn't happening. But knowing down deep, uh, it really is happening. And I think, mercifully, your mind kicks in and puts you in a state of semi-shock, uh, that you go through the motions, you know what you're doing. We had phone calls from stations everywhere in the country wanting a uh, voice report, uh, phone calls coming in from people uh, wanting to know uh, was it true? Did this really happen? I remember the, uh, the memorial service the next night at, at the old memorial field house. Uh, and I opened it. We, of we offered it free to any station in the area or the state that wanted it. And we got through the broadcast. All of that was done. And then uh, right at the end, uh, Jim Martin, late Jim Martin, was sitting with me. And it finally got to me, and I choked up, and we never signed off the program. I just couldn't say anything. I'm not sure a sign-off was necessary. And I recall so well the uh, following week with all of the uh, funerals, uh, not only uh, the, the ball players' families coming in. Uh, you try to think of something to say to make, uh, make it easier for them, give them some kind of solace, but knowing good and well there's nothing you could say or do that could make these people feel better who lost their sons. And then all of the local people, their funerals, day after day after day. And uh, in later years, as I look back on it, it's still uh, like a dream sequence. It just blurs together as if uh, uh, I, I watched it from somewhere else. During the summer of 1995, WSAZ took another risk and achieved another technological first. Adding a low power transmitter in the Kanawha Valley and securing the cooperation of cable operators with that area, WSAZ began sending a separate signal from the Charleston studios. News tailored specifically for the Charleston area viewer. Capital City News was born and WSAZ's rich history of providing viewers with relevant information was taken a step further. Since then have come the region's largest network of tower cameras, 
stretching from Portsmouth to Charleston. The most advanced internet website of any local TV station. And the area's only first warning weather van. And digital satellite uplink. All part of continuing a philosophy first established nearly 50 years ago. Friends we all grew up with. We'll be right back. Forty-nine. The flicker of a test pattern signals the beginning of local television. Now, 50 years later, you can own these exclusive WSAC collectibles celebrating our history. Friends we all grew up with. The 160-page coffee table book is available for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. And now, exclusive hand-numbered Mr. Cartoon Cat's Meows are available for $13.95 plus s &H. Send check or money order to WSAC Anniversary, P.O. Box 2115 Huntington. The speed at which improvements in technology are being made grows ever faster. Uh, so many things have happened in this short period of 50 years that it would be difficult to say what's going to be in the next 50 years because it seems to be engaging change faster than it did when we were doing it. It's like comparing a Model T Ford to uh, a Lexus. <laughs> But some things will never change. The people of WSAZ will always be committed to providing the best entertainment, news, and information, and to be an integral part of the community it joined 50 years ago. This is my second family. WSAZ really was. A lot of people said, you know, that's, that should be tough work, you know. I loved what I did, and I'd like to do it the best I could. I don't know of a better way to make a living. We didn't get rich, but we sure had a good time. <laughs> many, many memories. All good. And the uh, best decision I ever made in my life. And we had good people, a uh, good station, we had good ratings. Uh, oh, I liked it here. I loved it while I was doing it. I am so pleased now to be out of it. The Associated Press used to say, deadline every minute for broadcast news. And that's true. And that kind of pressure is a strain which takes a hearty soul to survive. When you can say you liked the job at WSAC, the family at WSAC, more than any of the other things you did in your life. That's a compliment, don't you think? Flying by the seat of the pants. We had to invent it along because it didn't exist. But it was fun. Father of a seven-pound girl last night. Mother okay, 